Good morning and welcome to Encompass Live. I am Emily Nimsikant, the Cataloging Librarian here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Your usual host, Krista Burns, is out today, so I am filling in as both host and presenter today. Encompass Live is the Nebraska Library Commission's weekly online event. We cover NLC activities and other library-related topics. The sessions are free and they are presented for one hour every Wednesday at 10 a.m. Central Time, and they include things like presentations, interviews, book reviews, web tours, mini training sessions, and Q&A sessions. As I said, I'm your presenter today, and I will be talking about the topic of how to catalog a kit. And this topic sort of came to mind because I taught a class on cataloging three-dimensional objects not too long ago, and during the evaluation, some people mentioned that they'd like to know more about kits in particular, and I thought about it, and you know that kits are something that are pretty unique. They're handled kind of differently from any other objects you might encounter when you're cataloging, so I thought it was worthy of an Encompass Live session. And I do want to say that the material in this presentation assumes that you have a basic familiarity with cataloging and AACR2 rules and MARC format. So I'm not going to cover every area of description in detail or focus on every single MARC tag. You know, that would probably not fit into a one-hour presentation. So I'm going to basically focus on the areas that are different with kits than other library materials. But if you do have questions about something that I've glossed over, feel free to stop me and ask a question. We can take questions um, via text if through the question box. You can type them in. Or if you have a microphone, go ahead and click on the raise a hand icon and I'll be able to see that you have your hand raised. I can unmute your microphone. You can go ahead and ask your question. Also, kits are definitely a type of object that are handled differently from library to library. Everybody kind of has their own local interpretation of the rules and so I definitely would like to hear your experiences if you have worked with kits in your library and you have something to contribute to the conversation, please do either type it into the question box or indicate that you have something to say and I'll unmute your microphone. So first of all, let's start off by answering the question of what is a kit? And here are the definitions from the glossary of AACR2. There's two different definitions. One is an item containing two or more categories of material no one of which is identifiable as the predominant constituent of the item. And so basically that means you have two different types of material and it's not, you know, a book with a CD of supplemental material. It's something where the two or more items are considered to be equally important. And then the other definition is a single medium package of textual material. So even if they're all the same type of material, it doesn't have to be multi-material. If they're all text items, but if there's, you know, student workbooks and a teacher's guide and activity packets, that still qualifies as a kit. So one thing to point out about kits is that they don't have a chapter of their own in AACR2, unlike some other classes of materials. The instructions for the working with them are kind of scattered throughout. Basically, one of the areas where you'll find the closest to a kit being mentioned is in Rule 1.10. It refers to items made up of several types of materials. A lot of the rules from Chapter 10 for three-dimensional artifacts can apply, but you also kind of need to be aware of rules depending on the particular type of material you have in your kit for video recordings or sound recordings, things like that. So when you're getting started cataloging, the first thing you're going to need to know is what your chief source of information is. And the good news is that it's pretty much anything. The chief source of information is the whole item. This is something that is based off of the three-dimensional artifacts rules. Information can be taken from anywhere on the item. And to get started, you're going to need to figure out which bibliographic format you're working with and what work form to choose when you're creating a record. And it is considered to be a visual material. This is also something that is based off of the three-dimensional artifacts rules. We go with visual materials. And this is an example of how you would create that work form if you're working with OCLC connection. Your local system will probably differ a little bit, but it should still have an option for visual materials. So we'll start off with the title and statement of responsibility area. Just like pretty much any other item, the title statement goes in Markfield 245, and you transcribe it as it appears on the item. And remember, 
You can take it from anywhere on the item. The chief source of information is anywhere. And as usual, if no title is given, supply one in brackets. Now the important thing to remember about a kit with the 245 field is that the GMD, or General Material Designation, is going to be necessary. There's a list of terms found in AACR 2 in Chapter 1 that you can use, and kit is one of them. So that is an authorized term to use for a GMD. And so here's an example of what that 245 field would look like. In subfield A, you have the title statement, and in subfield H, you have the GMD for kit. This is an example that I found of a kit that some libraries have made by a bifocal company. It's a sort of a prop company with some discussion guidelines that's meant to be taken to visit older people in nursing homes and things like that. So, and their title of their kit is hats. So that's what I've entered in the 245 here. And I see that we've had some more people join us, so I'm just going to take a second and mark people down on the attendance sheet here. And here's an example of a supplied title. If, for example, you have created this kit in your library and it did not come with a published title, you can go ahead and supply a title. For example, if you had put together a crochet kit with a couple of books on crocheting, plus maybe some yarn and a hook to try things out, you could call it a crochet kit and put that in brackets because you supplied the title. And this still gets the subfield age with the GMD of kit. And you'll notice in both of these examples I don't have a subfield C for the statement of responsibility. A lot of times you won't see that with kits because there's no individual you can point to as being responsible for the intellectual content. But I do have an example later when we get to talking about main and added entries that will show you one that does have a subfield C. And as usual, the varying forms of the title can go in fields 246. They can be titles found on other areas of the item, and this is something you might encounter with kits. You know, the pack outside package might have one title, but then something on the inside has a variation of the title, and so you, it would be something you would want to keep an eye out. And as usual, you can always use the 246 for spelling out numbers and abbreviations. Now the next area that I'm going to talk about that is sometimes a little bit different from other items is the publication area, which goes in Mark Field 260. As usual, you put the place of publication in subfield A, the publisher in subfield B, and the date of publication in subfield C. You can see an example here for this bifocal kit. And you might run into a little bit of difficulty knowing exactly what the publisher is. You have to maybe do some research on some company names you find on the items. But for the most part, it is handled pretty straightforward, just like other items you would catalog. One situation that might be a little bit different you might encounter would be a locally constructed kit. A lot of libraries will do this. They'll put together a book and some puppets for story time or something like that, things that are not commercially produced as a kit, but it's created in-house in the library. And in that case, you know, there's, I've seen a lot of discussion on cataloging listservs and things like that about what you should do in this situation. And the general consensus seems to be that you can go ahead and use your library as the publisher. You can see there, this is an example from a locally produced kit, the record that I found at OCLC, and use the library's place as the place of publication, the library's name as a publisher, and then use the date that the kit was put together for the publication date. Even if some of the components, if there are books that were published earlier, it's still the intellectual work of putting the kit together was done when you put the kit together, and so we use that for the publication date. Now the next area that I'm going to talk about is the physical description area. This obviously goes in Mark Field 300. And there are kind of two options here. You can provide a general description here that just basically says that it's a kit and then give a more specific description of the various components later in a note. Or you can go ahead and describe all the components of a kit in this area. And it kind of depends on how many items are in the kits, where you think your patrons are likely to look for this description. It's up to you which one of these you want to choose. Here is an example of the two options for this kit from Bifogels. You can just call it a kit in the subfield A 
and then you can give the dimensions. You can either give the dimensions of the item itself, or if it is in the container, you can give those as well. The second option also gives the different items spelled out. It has two masks, it has a visiting card, and a discussion guide, and those will all go in subfield A. And then the container dimensions, again, are given in subfield C. And I do see something that I left out here. Sometimes you'll see that there's, obviously, there's no subfield B in either of these, and it's not necessarily required, but if you were going to put in a subfield B, it would have the type of material that these items were made out of. So you would put paper and cardboard or something like that to describe these items. Do we have any questions so far? Okay, I'll keep going then. The next area that we're going to talk about is the notes area. These all go in the 5XX fields. Here are some of the common uses for notes that you'll see with kits. You can give a source of a title, notes relating to the statement of responsibility, physical description notes, contents notes, the summary notes, and audience notes. For example, as I noted, sometimes you'll need to supply the title for a kit, and if you do that, you should add a note that says title supplied by cataloger. You can also include a note just various other sources of the title. And you'll see here, this one goes in a general 500 note. It could be a statement of responsibility note, which also goes in a 500 field. In this case, here's a note that I found in that record from the locally produced kit for the Roseville Public Library. They put in a note indicating that they were the ones who developed the kit and as part of a program called Every Child Ready to Read. There's a physical description note that's possible. As I mentioned before, if you decide to put a shortened version of the description in the 300 field, if you just called it a kit, you could put in a note explaining what the various components are. And another note that you might see used in kits that you probably wouldn't encounter with other three-dimensional objects is the formatted contents field, field 505. And so you'll see with this kit here that we put together, we have two books that were published individually. They both have titles, they both have authors, and these are things that you might want to bring out in your record for this kit. And so what I've done here is created a formatted contents note in the 505 field indicating the names and authors of these books. Now the first example is a basic contents note. It just has all the information in a subfield A, and if you pay attention to the, the punctuation, let's see here, you can see that there is a space colon space. As usual, if there's a subtitle, there are slashes between the title and the statement of responsibility, and then there's the dashes between space dash space between the individual titles. But it all goes in subfield A. And the fact that it's a basic contents note is indicated by the fact that the second indicator is blank. Whereas the second example is an enhanced contents note, and that's indicated by the second indicator of zero. And you'll notice that instead of subfield A, in this case, the titles go in subfield T, and the authors go in subfield R. But other than that, the punctuation remains the same. And in this case, the reason you might do that is because that allows the titles to be indexed in your title search and the author's names to be indexed in your author search if you wanted to, depending on if your system does it. And you'll notice that even though there were other items in this kit, there was some yarn, some a crochet hook, other materials, only the published items with titles are mentioned in this 505 field. And I've seen this done other ways in some records for kits that I've seen on OCLC. Sometimes people go ahead and put all the items in here. They'll put another set of dashes and then put one crochet hook or 
one ball of yarn and lay out all of the items, but I really think that's not the intended purpose of this field. I think, you know, that basically replicates what you have in a physical description note or the 300 field, and I really think that the purpose of a formatted contents note is to bring out items that have specific titles that are not included in the collective title for the kit. So another example of a field that you might use is the 520 field, and the notes in the 520 field are a summary, and so that would just briefly describe what the kit is about. For example, this tells you that it is a visiting card and the props, two cardboard masks, they're intended to prompt discussion of hat, hat styles since the turn of the century. You know, if it's, when you're lo dealing with three-dimensional objects and other than textual items, you know, it's kind of hard for people to browse and get an idea of what it is involved from just looking at the catalog records, so it helps to add a summary note. An audience note is another note that you might include, and this goes in a 521 field. And one thing to remember is that you should only include this note if it actually appears, an audience statement actually appears on the item. You are not required and not permitted to supply your own audience statement. Okay, we're going to just talk briefly about main and added entries. And as I said before, you won't extremely often probably see personal names for a main entry. Sometimes you will, and this is an example of a 245 field where we do have a statement of responsibility in subfield C. There are two people who are chiefly responsible for the intellectual content of this kit. And you will probably most likely see this in, you know, things like curriculum kits where there is a great deal of textual information, a book has been written, there are activity guides that were developed, and so there would probably actually be authors of this kit. And so in that case, you will need a 110, and I just realized I have a typo in this slide, it's not a 110 field, it should be a 100 field for a personal name, and a 700 field, not a 710 field. Pardon my typos there. But you will put the first person's, the author's name in a 100 field, and then you will notice that if there is a main entry under the name, then the first indicator in your 245 field is a 1, as usual. If there's not a person's name or a corporate name, or not a person's name chiefly responsible for it, you will probably have the title main entry, and in that case, the 245 first indicator is zero. But any corporate bodies responsible for it should always receive a 710 added entry. So those were a basic overview of the variable fields and the highlights of things that are different from other types of materials that you might be cataloging. Does anybody have any questions before we move on to fixed fields? Okay, well we'll talk a little bit about the fixed fields then, and again, there are, most of the fields will be similar, they're not going to be anything unusual from what you might encounter with other types of materials, or at least with other visual materials, but there are a couple that are unique to kits, and so we're going to talk about those. First one is the type of record field, and you find those one up here. And the code for kits is O. And you can see down here I have the description from the OCLC bibliographic formats and standards describing a kit. It's 
Again, as I've been mentioning before, the important thing about kids is that no one component is identifiable as the predominant component, because otherwise you would just catalog it as a book with accompanying material or a CD with accompanying material. The other fixed field that is unique to kits is the type of material field. And that will appear up here. Again, these are the fixed fields as they appear in an OCLC connection record. They might look a little bit different in your local system. And again, there's a field that is specifically for kits. It's defined here as a mixture of components from two or more categories, no one of which is identifiable as the primary constituent of the item. And other than that, the fixed fields are basically what you're used to. They're, there's nothing that's particularly unique to kits. Now while we're on the topic of fixed fields, when you encounter a kit, as I said before, there's obviously it means that you have several different types of materials. And so one thing that you might encounter is the concept of how to represent these various different materials and whether you need to add more codes for them. And you'll encounter the option of an 006 field. And you're probably used to this concept from things like computer resources that require this field extra because it brings out another aspect of the item. These the elements in the 006 field have the same input standards as the fixed field codes. They're the exact same codes and they're just sort of supplemental on top. You know, in the fixed field we represented this item as a visual material, but if it has a computer resource in it, you will need to bring that out for the 006. And if it also has, you know, things like video recordings and sound recordings that were not reflected in your fixed fields, you're going to add want to add another one of the 006 fields to bring this out. If it's just important, it depends on how your system indexes these fields and if they will be worth your time, if they're going to be used in a meaningful way in your system. Here is an example of the instructions for the 006 field that as it's displayed in the OCLC bibliographic formats and standards and there's the address down there at the bottom of the screen. This is a definitely a very good resource to consult. You can see it's described as a field for additional material characteristics and that's basically what I was saying that if it's there is character are characteristics that are not represented in your fixed field and you feel that are important to be brought out in the record, you will include an 006 field for it. And these same codes can be found at the Library of Congress website when they're MARC standards and that's loc.gov slash mark, and that's down at the bottom of the screen there too. And you'll see that there are different codes for different types of materials given here. Now, sort of a related but slightly different field is the 007 field. And it again has one character code or a certain number of character codes that are similar to those found in the fixed fields and the 006. However, unlike the 006, the 007 does have different fields, different input standards than the regular fixed fields. And so it, it brings out characteristics of your items that are not reflected in the fixed field or the 006. And you might be familiar with this if you work with sound recordings or video recordings or electronic resources. 007s come into play here. And so it's basically just the same side of concept behind that. If there are those type of items in your kit, then you might want to add an 007 to bring out the aspects of those that you feel are important. So you can see here, this is again is a screenshot from the OCLC bibliographic formats and standards, and there are a few different types of 007 fields. The inputs are a little bit different depending on what you're working with. You have an electronic resource or a sound recording or a video recording. 
the codes you use are going to be a little bit different. And here again is a screenshot from the Library of Congress Mark Standards website, which also breaks these down into their various categories. For example, you'll see things like electronic resources or maps or motion pictures. It's basically just the same information presented in a different format. And when you click on, for example, let me go back to the bibliographic formats and standards page. If you click on one of these along the side, the video recording, and so on and so forth, you'll, you'll get the input standards for each individual category. You'll see that there are some different subfields in each one. Here's the ones for video recordings. And there are things like category material, whether it's color or not, video recording format. And they'll vary a little bit from format to format. Here's the one for sound recordings. And it still has a category of material, but it doesn't have, for example, something for color because it's not a visual object, but it would have dimensions, tape width, things like that. And here's an example of how these 007 fields would come into play in a record. This is a record for a kit, and you'll see it has several different items. It has a textbooks, a teacher's edition book, and then CD-ROMs, audio CDs, and DVDs. And so you'll see that they've chosen that some of these are important enough to bring out in the 007 field. They wanted to highlight the, their presence. They've got three different 007 fields up here for the CD-ROMs, the sound recordings, the audio CDs, and the DVDs. And you'll see how they all have a little bit of different codes in them. For example, this one is the CD-ROMs, the electronic resource. This one is the sound recordings. And actually, just when I was putting this together at the end, I noticed that they use the code M here, which is for motion picture. So that's actually, the row 7 is done incorrectly because it should be a video recording for their DVDs. But you can kind of get the concept that if you have multiple materials and you want to bring out aspects of all of them, you can add as many OO7s as you need to in order to express all of those materials. Now it's sort of a question of, you know, this is best practices, this is what they tell you to do, you can add these fields in order to bring out these items, but if you have a kit with a lot of different types of items, you might not have the time to deal with this, and if your system doesn't index the fields, perhaps, to use them to their greatest advantage, and they're not going to help your patrons anyway, you might not want to do this. When I was looking for information on this and how people use 006 fields and 007 fields when it comes to things like kits, I found a, what I thought was a pretty good resource out there. It's called When to Add 006 and 007 Fields, and it's um, created by a organization called Cooperative Computer Services that provides automation services for libraries in Illinois. And there's the web address there. And you don't necessarily need to worry about writing it down. We will have these slides available afterwards, and all of the links will be available in the Commission's Delicious account. So you don't have to keep track of this link. But I found it to be a very good website. It explains sort of some of the decision-making process you would go through when deciding if it's worth it to spend your time and energy adding these fields. And you can see it has some examples of the amount of 006 and 007 fields you could potentially use for a kit. There's, they have an example of things, various items, not just kits, but there were a couple of examples. A kit with CDs and book and CD-ROM, for example, will have quite a few extra fields. Something that has a DVD with book, video cassette, audio with CD, CD-ROM, and a map will have even more if you wanted to bring out all the aspects of the various items and if your system supports those.
I do want to point out a couple of resources for cataloging kits. As I said, they're not the rules for do, handling them are not extremely well defined in AACR2. There's not a special cat, chapter just for them, but there are some people out there who have done the work of creating guidelines for kits. And we do have both of these books in our collection here at the Commission if you're interested in them. And I've pointed out which chapter in each of them is devoted to kids. And again, our slides will be available afterwards, so you don't necessarily have to worry about copying all of these down. And I also found a couple of online resources, too. Other, besides the one that I just mentioned about the 006 and 007 field, I did find a couple of good general resources about cataloging kids. And both of these appear to be sort of workflows, you know, resources that people, individual libraries have, or library systems have made for their own catalogers to refer to when they're working with kids. And that's really just a good, kind of a good way to get ideas of how people handle these things. Now, both of these seem to be sort of pretty generalized rules. They didn't seem to have a whole lot of local processes in them, so that's why I included them as things that you can turn to for advice on handling kits. There are a number of websites out there where I found libraries with their own local processes for handling kits, and those are good to look at, too. So, you know, you might just search something like cataloging library kits, I think is what I searched, and I found a lot of sites. There are people's internal wikis, people's websites for their procedures and policies, and they will have laid out their process for handling kits. So that's a good place to turn for ideas on this. Did anybody have any other questions about these? This ended up being a pretty short <laughs> presentation, I guess. But my final thoughts on it would just be that it is kind of a type of material with a lot of gray area. There are some rules out there and some generally accepted practices, but do what works best for your library. Make your kits findable to your patrons. Do something that will be meaningful to the people who are looking for them, and do it consistently. When you decide how you're going to handle kits, go ahead and type up your procedures and maybe put them out there on the web for somebody else to use. And just make sure that it's handled consistently so that once your patrons get used to looking for kits, they know what they're looking for. Does anybody have any other questions? You guys have been a pretty quiet bunch today. Anybody handle kits in their library and have any words of wisdom? Okay then, well, thank you all for joining me. I hope you learned something, and remember that Encompass Live happens every Wednesday, so we hope to see you back here again in the future.